Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our uh, webinars, international webinar series in the class Building and Energy Efficiency. Today, we have the honor to have Elena Zambrano from Overland Partners in San Antonio in Texas. She will be talking about designing with metrics, daylighting, design and verification. Thank you for coming, Elena. Before I, I present Elena, I want to do some housekeeping. Uh, please keep your microphones off and if you can, your cameras. And uh, this will be recorded. So if you want to have access to this uh, lecture after it finished, please uh, let me know. Uh, also, the, um, the class uh, will not have uh, questions at the end. So if you have a question for the speaker, please let us know. and. Um, we will send her the questions and put her in contact. So make sure to have your contact details in there. Also, this is part of the uh, Building an Energy Efficiency class of uh, Tech de Monterrey, Escuela de Arquitectura. Uh, the goal is to um, get close to the students for professionals and influencers on building science and building efficiency. Uh, with this, we want to uh, build a network of professionals and uh, keep increasing the reach of uh, energy efficiency in buildings. Uh, also, I want to thank SUME, the Mexican Green Building Council. And I just want to let you know that we as EOSIS, as training partner of tech, we are committed with the immersive experience of a student and the project that you are seeing now in the screen it's made by Overland Partners that's in McAllen City and we are helping them with the lead calculations and uh, Elena was a very important part of us to get in that project so thank you Elena for that and now I'm gonna uh, present Elena, Elena Zambrano is licensed architect in the US and Mexico with over 10 years of national and international experience in a wide range of project types. As Overland Partner Sustainability Director, she established the firm Sustainability Division and leads the firm Sustainability Department. The department works with design teams from concept to post occupancy to deliver high performance project facilitated and integrated design process building performance simulation, material research, and building envelope analysis are key to this process. Elena works with the IRA Committee of the Environment to establish the framework for design excellence and develop the super spreadsheet to help architects understand sustainability metrics and reframe the way architects perceive and award architecture. Prior to joining Overland, Elena was a research associate at the T.C. Chan Center for Building Simulation and Energy Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. She earned a Master in Environmental Building Design from the University of Pennsylvania and a Bachelor of, in Architecture from Universidad de Monterrey. Elena believes sustainability is the basis of design excellence and sustainability in architecture it means engaging beautiful, healthy buildings in rich urban environments. She's particularly interested in daylighting design, urban ecology, and system thinking. Thank you very much, Elena, for uh, your participation. And now I give you the floor. Thank you. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, thanks. Yes. Okay, well, I'm very excited to be here in your class and share with you a project I worked on a few years ago and share what I learned. So the building is the new business school 
at Baylor University, which is this building. Um, it's a lead gold building. Uh, it's 275,000 square feet. Uh, higher education building, but today I want to focus on the design of the atrium, which is these uh, photographs that you see on the screen. And specifically the daylighting design of this atrium. So the concept for the atrium was to create a really dynamic space where students can spend a lot of the long study hours sort of a living room of the school. And it's, it's a big space. There's a lot of different task areas. There's transient spaces. There's spaces to study by yourself. There's spaces um, with group study, um, using with computers or reading. So there's a lot of things going on in this space. But the, the goals, the daylighting goals, was one, to avoid overheating. The building, as I said, is in uh, Baylor University, which is located in Waco, Texas. Texas, um, it's, as you may know, is really hot. We have a lot of sun. And atriums can be a really an energy hog for buildings. So one thing that we really wanted to avoid was overheating this building. A second daylighting goal was to modulate the light in a dynamic pattern, to add dynamism of an interest in this space. As students spend a lot of time inside this building, we wanted them to be still connected to the outside. We wanted this space to be really bright, but with natural light to be connected to the outside and not feel just dragged from spending too much time indoors. And the two main goals for daylighting was to provide obviously adequate light levels for different task areas and also avoid glare in task areas was really important. So this is a construction photo of the building and the space that you see that there's no roof, that's the atrium. So it's a really big space right in the middle of the building. And as I say, we wanted to be connected to the outdoors, but there's no connection to the outdoors through the envelope of the building. So the only part of the envelope that we had was obviously the roof. And the main challenges was that it is a four-story building. And the four stories are receding. You kind of are able to see it in this photograph so that receding of the floor plates was really challenging because we needed to provide adequate light levels from a single source, which is the roof. So how do you provide enough light to go all the way to the ground floor without overheating and overlighting the top floor? And another challenge was is the building is rotated 45 degrees off north. So one thing that I like to do before I start any of my projects is to see what are the available resources to, that I have. And for this case, for daylighting, the question was how much light does from the sun does actually come inside the space? And the atrium had its location. So it was in the middle of the, of the building. And the building have a massing already. So with the building massing and without the roof, the roof is what I'm going to be designing. I did these radiant simulations to see how much light actually comes inside the space. And this is what I found. Because of the 45 degree angle and the massing of the building, the building shades the atrium, so the building shades itself for half of the time. So in the morning, the eastern side is in shade and the opposite happens in the afternoon. So half of the time, or all of the time, half of the building is in shade. So that's how I came up with the concept for the, the daylighting design. So I said, well, what if we have these sun scoops that will catch 
the sun rays from the side of the sky where the sun is and bounce it inside of the space where there is um, the shading happening. And if we rotate them all in all different directions, then we can always catch some sun rays no matter where the sun is. So that's how the concept started. And the title of this talk was Designing with Metrics. So for this, what it really meant is letting performance inform the geometry of the sun scoops. And to evaluate performance, we use metrics. So that, that's why it's designing with metrics. And the sun scoops were obviously outside of the, the glazing areas of the roof. And these are all the variables that, that I had, all the angles and the height and the coverage. So what it really meant for this was that extensive daylighting simulation. And this is a point in time illuminance analysis of the geometry of the sun scoops at different times of the year, at different times of the day, and in different locations. So because so much of this design was to cater different light levels to different spaces, and different spaces vertically, and also different task areas, what I'm doing here is um, decoupling all the variables and testing them independently to really understand how the sun scoop geometry works. Then putting it all together, this is also a point in time illuminance to see how all the, the sun scoops work together as a whole. And it's also different times of the day and different times of the year. And that allows me to see how the whole design performs and to make sure that we that we hit those um, target illuminance. But was, what was also really important for this design was to analyze it in section because the space is so deep, we needed to see how it was performing. And you see this atrium also has these uh, floating boxes that are task areas as well. So this is, uh, an annual simulation, which annual simulations help you to understand quickly the performance of, of the space. And as I said, we, we look at it vertically because when, when um, you're designing a top lid space, the vertical surfaces become really important for the performance, especially for tall spaces you really need those vertical surfaces to help you diffuse the light to be able to go to all the way to the ground level. And as you start to, to analyze the space and really dial in in the geometry, it's an iterative process, right? You test some assumptions and with the results of these tests, you influence the geometry of the space and the elements. And it's really easy to get lost between all of these data that you're creating. So that's why it's extremely important and a really good practice to have very clear goals of what you're trying to accomplish. So as you go in the process, you can go back and evaluate the, the schemes against your goals. And you can also or you also should understand what part of the design or what physical element is doing what work to accomplish the goal. So if you see in this diagram, if you review the goals again, you can see which part of the design is helping me accomplish which goal. So this uh, diagrammatic RCP in the bottom, it's, uh, it's showing how the, the clusters work together. So you can see some of them get illuminated um, brightly during the afternoon and then the opposite happens at night because the sun moves um, across the sky. Um, but also, so you, we have been talking about the sun scoops, which are the elements that you see above 
the skylights on the dia diagrammatic section. And I'm also talked about the uh, vertical surfaces that help me diffuse the light. But a key element, third element for uh, this design was the baffles. So the baffles are these triangular shapes that come under the, the skylight, so inside the space. And they have several functions, but the main function is to diffuse the light further. So the sun rays come in and it diffuses the light further inside the space. But it, the other function is to section, section the roof in different areas. That's responding to what's happening on the floor plan. So some areas will always be brighter than others, maybe because the light has to go all the way to the ground floor or because it's an area that needs more light. And what it allows us to do is to reduce the amount of glass by 90, 96%. Which if you remember in the beginning, the main goal was to avoid overheating. So in addition to shave the glass with the sun scoops, the baffle allows us to make the, the size of the glass a lot smaller, 96% smaller. So that was a, a huge uh, improvement to avoid adding cooling load to the building. And also it made the, the whole design economically feasible, which is going to become really important when you start practicing. So this is how it looks. You can see um, the baffles getting illuminated in, with different intensities at any given time. What you can also start to see is different colors of light. And we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. But um, so far, I, I have been showing you the, the simulation results uh, from illuminance studies, which illuminance is the sun um, sorry, the light rays that come from the source, in this case the sun, but it can be also a light bulb. So it's the, the light rays that come from the source and hit the surfaces. So it's, it's the way we quantify the amount of light that different task areas and different spaces require. For example, an office building, you need around 300 logs. A medical lab might need a thousand logs, but 50 logs might be enough for a corridor. So that's the way we quantify um, how much light uh, space received to perform different areas, different task areas. But it doesn't tell you how the space will look. And so much of this design was about creating this beautiful and dynamic space. So during design, how do we really make sure that our assumptions of how this is going to look is what is going to happen in reality? So there is different types of analysis. This one is a luminance analysis. Luminance as opposed to illuminance. Luminance is the light that it's bounced off the surfaces. So it's the light is what we see, what our eyes see. So this, um, there was a series of simulations with radiance uh, to create these luminance visualizations. These are all process images, so they are not uh, presentation images. That was, they are a little bit dark. Um, what I was testing here is the light just coming from the skylights, not other light from the envelope. So, and it only has. Um, two or three ambient bounces. So it's not what, um, as I said, there's not finished images, it's process images to understand how the light is coming in with two or three ambient bounces. So luminance allows to see the quantity of light that is going to be reflected from the surfaces. That's the analysis that we do to understand 
the light intensity on the baffles. This is a time lapse of the actual building to, um, to see those light intensities. And there is also this qualitative analysis, which this is a physical model. And to do the qualitative analysis, you have to use the sun. The sun, a physical model, and a helion and a sundial. And because only the sun can truly give you the light, the light color in the space. So in the previous image, I alluded to uh, the baffles picking up different light temperatures. And that's because how the sun location and how it travels through the sky. So in the third image, you can kind of see some of the baffles and of the skylights getting different tints. So the baffles are a highly reflective white, but they're non-specular. And this is an HDR photography of the center skylights from looking from the ground floor. These images were taken the day we went to the space to do the post occupancy evaluation to verify that all of our assumptions were working or not working and understand and learn from them. So in these um, images you see the baffles, the six baffles on the right side of each image. In the morning they look kind of yellowish and that's because those baffles are open, I'm sorry, those sun scoops are open to the south southeast and the sun just comes right in but the same six baffles in the afternoon look a little cooler in a grayish tint and that's because the sun is on the opposite side of the sky so i think that's the beauty of this design how how you can perceive different light intensities and light colors at any given time and the beauty is that it's all based on geometry. So for the post-occupancy evaluation study, we were there inside the, the building for a whole day from sunrise to sunset, pretty close to the spring equinox. And this is the equipment that we use. We had um, illuminance meters, data loggers, DSLR, cameras with remote control exposure control and a luminance spot meter and obviously all of the other lights in the building were off so we were really taking the um the luminance luminance readings from the skylights only so on this little sensor is the luminance meter it's a highly sensitive sensor. It has a range pretty close to the human eye. So it's, it's a pretty cool piece of equipment. It also has GPS, except that as you may know, GPS doesn't work inside a building. So what you can use instead is this technology SLAM, which stands for Simultaneous Location and Mapping which you can do is have a lighter and your meter and walk around the space and you end up with a 3D image of the space with the illuminance and luminance meter uh, map on the space. Well, this is a few years ago and we did not have lighter. So we didn't use it. We went the super analog route, which is this image of the floor plan with the skylights overlap on, on the atrium. We basically taped this path that you see in purple in the screen and have stopping points. And we did this for every floor and you can see how the, the outline moves as the floor plates recede. This is the fourth floor. And this is what we ended up with. So basically I'm walking with a dialogue on my hand and we taped the our little sensor in this wheel cart with the pole so we can 
walk around the space and the sensors stayed at the same level. So we didn't make the mistake of taking light measurements at different um, heights vertically. And then we ended up with a map of like you see on the diagram on the left of all the values, illuminance values, the measure values next to the simulated values. And the analysis we're going to take from the points where you see A to D, but it was important that we get um, readings from adjacent points, not just the study points, because sometimes you can have like furniture that is casting a shadow or someone passing by or a cloud went by and then it will affect your your reading so you have other adjacent points to compare and make sure that your data is good or you can correct it so let's see what we found on uh, this graph will tell you the each hour of the day that's when we took the readings and the logs readings. So in gray, there is the measure values, and in red is the simulated values. And as you can see, the measure values are, are all over the place. The simulated values has this nice arc that you might see from the sunrise, and then the sun high in the sky at noon, and then uh, the sun going down but they are not at all in accordance. So the first thing that we do to understand what happened is to do a subjective analysis. And let's see, let's see what this data is telling us. In the morning, it's pretty cloudy. And we can see that, well, we, we knew that because we were there, but we can also see it in the numbers because the measure values are super low. And as opposed to the afternoon, especially at 4 p.m., the two values are really close. And we can see that the, the sun came out at that point. If taking the percentage error, the percentage error in the 4 p.m. readings is 9%. And most of the readings in the mornings is more than 50%, which is crazy. But um, it, it, these, two, um, these two things are clues to let us know what's, what's going on. So then we, every time that we took readings inside, we took readings outside. And this is the outdoor illuminance readings same, the gray is the measure and the, the red is the simulated. The simulated values, we can get them easily from the weather file. So by comparing the two, we see that there is a big difference between, between the, value, the starting point, right? So what we were comparing was the simulated sky, we had clear sky, and that's why it has this nice arc in the graph. And the measure sky was really cloudy. So we cannot compare um, the illuminance from if you start from very different places. So what we do is find the percentage uh, error from the two outer readings and apply it to the simulated values. And this is what this graph tells us. The gray is the measure, the red is the simulated, and the purple is the corrected simulated. So if we see them by themselves, Oh, and that allows us to compare a simulated sky that was um, very similar to the measured sky or the same as the measured sky. So putting those two together, the measure values and the corrected simulated, we see that they're actually super close, which it's incredibly exciting for, for us because our design, all of our assumptions and all our simulations are basically on point. So that was a part of how much, how much um, light is in the space. And the other side, as I mentioned during design that was very important to us is the, these light intensities on the baffles 
and the light colors. For that, we use a luminance meter uh, to get a reference point, and with the DSLR cameras, and um, we're in the picture, we're doing a white balance with a gray board, also as a reference value. The, we set two DSLR cameras, one on the ground floor, which is the one in the image, just looking straight up to, towards the roof, and one on the fourth floor looking down at the space. And the, we took 11 full stop images or photographs. And so 11 because you have the normal exposure plus five on either side. And then we, com we combine those using the reference luminance reading in Photosphere to create uh, the HDR photography. So these are the results of the HDR photography. And which are this, the same in, images that I showed before, where you can see the light in the baffles changing in intensity and in color. A lot of these images are with a cloudy sky, which is it's a little, it was a little sad to us that it was cloudy because when the sun came out, the baffles really picked up the, those. Um, light temperatures that we were looking for, like the one you see at 6 p.m. and at 8 a.m. So using those images, you, we can get converted into false color imaging, and that really allows us to study these light intensities. These are the images from the camera that was on the fourth floor looking down. And these are the false color images from, from those photographs. And we had two cameras, one up and one down, to be able to study how the light intensities on the baffles affect the, the task areas on the ground floor. So you, you see those six Six baffles on the right of each image are the ones on the south, open to the south uh, east. That's why they are so bright in the morning and in the afternoon, the second image, they become less bright. And I will leave you with uh, another image of the skylights from the ground floor. This is just using a long exposure instead of the normal exposure combining into an HDR photography. This is long exposure and we just thought it looked really cool. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Elena, thank you very much for your lecture. Very interesting. And they are going through the same process now. So it's very interesting to see how you managed to do these measurements on real life and on the uh, different uh, uh, simulation track. So thank you very much for that. We will end up this uh, session of Zoom. If you please join in a couple of minutes to the new session to end up the recording. Thank you very much, Elena. See you in a couple of minutes. Okay.